Okay, welcome back everyone. This is the uh, third tutorial in the Emerging Topics section. Um, and it's the tutorial on high performance hardware for machine learning. So in the, in the following two hours, Bill, Bill Daly will survey the state of the art in high performance hardware for machine learning with an emphasis on hardware for training and deployment of deep neural nets. So it's kind of a continuation of what we've seen in the morning by, uh, by Jeff. D deep neural nets have an amazing popularity as we can all see here in this conference, not the least due to the efficiency with which they can be trained on GPUs. I think uh, Bill's going to talk about that. So GPU implementations of deep neural networks make substantial improvements over the CPU-based implementations. And in this tutorial, Bill will also discuss some general observation about the relative importance of arithmetic and memory bandwidth in dedicated hardware for general machine learning tasks. So a few words about Bill before we get started. Bill is the chief scientist of NVIDIA and a senior vice president of NVIDIA Research. He joined NVIDIA in 2009 after 12 years at Stanford University where he was chairman of the computer science department and the Villiard, and the Villiard R. and uh, Ines Kerbel professor of engineering. In fact, he's still at Stanford one day a week. Um, at Stanford, Bill and his team developed the systems architecture, network architecture, signaling, routing, and synchronization technology that's found in most of the par large parallel computers today. Bill was also at the MIT from 1986 to 1997, where he and his team built the J and the M machine, <clears throat> experimental per, uh, parallel computer systems that pioneered the separation of mechanisms from programming models and demonstrated very low overhead synchronization and communication mechanisms. From 83 to 86, he was at Caltech, where he designed the MOSIMS simulations engine and the Taurus routing chip, which pioneered wormhole routing and virtual channel flow control. Bill is also a co-founder of Valio Communications and Stream Processors. He's a member of the National Academy of Engineering, a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a fellow of the IEEE and the ACM. He received the 2015 Funai Achievement Award from the Information Processing Society of Japan, the 2010 Eckert Muchley Award, and which is considered the highest prize in computer architecture, as well as the 2004 IEEE Computer Society Seymour Cray Computing Engineering Award and the 2000 ACM Morris Wilkie Award. He received bachelor degree in electrical engineering at Virginia Tech, master's degree in electrical engineering from Stanford, and a PhD in computer science from Caltech in 86. That's a long list of achievements. One thing that I haven't mentioned is in his spare time, Bill does not work on hardware, but Bill does work on images. So he's a very avid photographer, and he sees some of the photography that Bill is doing when it's in spare time. So that's an impressive picture, but I found that one even more impressive. And so with those images, Let's welcome Bill to the stage. Well, thank, thank you, Rolf. It's a real, real pleasure to be here. Um, you know, by the way, you need to have somebody generate all those images for the next version of uh, the ImageNet competition. Um, um, I really find it exciting to be talking to the deep learning community because I find um, that the deep learning community has a lot of the excitement that the hardware community had back in the 1980s when things were moving very quickly. I see people put papers up on archive and within a week people are starting to code their own version of it and getting some results and building on the work. Um, and that, that's just a very ex exciting environment to be in. I think a lot of the reason um, why it's so exciting and, and uh, this was sort of mentioned in um, the uh, sort of uh, Jan Lekun and uh, Yosho uh, tutorial this morning is the ideas in deep learning have been around for a long time. Uh, when I was a graduate student at Caltech, I took a course uh, with John Hopfield and learned all about you know, neural nets at the time and Hopfield nets. And um, convolutional neural networks have been around since Jan Lekun's paper in the 1980s. Uh, most of the ideas that we're deploying today have their roots no later than the early 1990s. And the reason why it's taking off now, it didn't take off then, is really twofold. Um, first, to make uh, deep learning really work, you need to have a lot of data to train on. Let's see if I can find a mouse here. So you need things like the ImageNet um, uh, data set. You know, without having sufficient data, you can't train a big model. You'll, you'll overfit and you'll get really poor results. But the other factor is you need really good computing. The computing horsepower you needed to build realistic deep learning systems simply did not exist in the 80s and 90s. So it was great that all the foundational work was done there. So now, now that we have hardware, um, we can move forward. Um, the, um, the, the, there's a real need for speed in deep learning. And I thought it was really captured um, well in this paper um, by Lavin and Gray. I took an excerpt out of it here, where they basically point out that if you have a large data set, then you can build a bigger model, because you, you, know, you basically have a model with more capacity um, if you have more data to train it with. 
And then if you have a bigger model, you need more need for compute. And in particular, if you're deploying this in a real-time application, for example, for driver assistant in automotive, um, you also are latency constrained. And this means two things. One is there's a huge premium put on getting the um, task, whether it's classification or detection, done very quickly. Um, but, but also, um, um, you can't batch the problem. You can't try to make the problem easier by queuing up you know, eight or 64 images and then running them as a batch to, to turn your matrix vector multiplication into a matrix matrix multiplication. You have to run very fast with a batch size of one. Um, and and you know, one final point I'll make on this slide is, for years when people had a need for speed, they could just wait. And the next processor um, you know, from the big CPU manufacturers would solve their problems because Moore's Law was giving you huge gains every year. That's over. Um, you know, the, uh, the real performance you gain, you get out of a process node of technology, is probably around 1.1 to 1.2x. Um, so you're no longer getting that 2x per generation that you got at one point in time. But we still have this need to build bigger models and run on larger data sets. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we're going to address that need. Um, here's an outline for the talk. I won't read it to you, but you'll see this slide at the beginning of, of each section. Um, the first section is really to try to define the problem we're solving and, and set up a nomenclature for the rest of the talk. Um, so the problem really has a couple aspects to it. Um, the first is we'd like to run faster. Um, this is you know, whether um, it has to do with um, being able to run a driver assist program real time, which might mean a latency of no more than you know, 30 milliseconds or so. Um, or maybe I simply want to train a large network in a few days rather than months. Um, but very often, um, in addition to just being faster, I want to be more efficient. And efficiency has two dimensions. Um, very often, particularly in data center applications, we're really limited by power. Um, the amount of computing we can put into a rack is limited by how much I can pr provide power to that rack and cool that rack. Very often 20 kilowatts or 30 kilowatts per rack. So in a very real sense, a measure of, of goodness of a deep learning application is inferences per joule or inferences per second per watt if you prefer to mix the units up. Um, and, and that really determines how much I can get done on a certain power budget. Um, also, very often we don't have infinite financial resources and I'm interested in inferences per second per dollar. Um, so um, I'll also talk about a couple related problems. If all I'm doing is inference, that means running the network forward, I'm presenting an input. You know, if, if I'm doing a computer vision application, the input will be an image and I will get an output, perhaps a detection. Um, that's simply running the network in one direction. But to, to, before I could deploy that network, I had to train it. And for training, I need to do two things. One is to run the network forward, but then I need to take the, um, the loss function that I get and propagate the gradients backward through the network. It turns out that that computation is almost exactly the same as the forward computation, but running in reverse. But I'll talk about the nature of those computations. And then as I propagate that gradient past the weights, I want to take the partial derivative of, of the gradient with respect to the weight and update the weights with that. So there's a weight update, which can wind up being a bottleneck um, for training if it's not done carefully. And then there's the question of what type of network we're running. So if I'm running a, a fully connected deep neural network, something that looks like this, I want to run one type of operation. In fact, for this type of network, the critical operation is to do a um, dense matrix times vector multiply. So the way to think about it is for each layer of the network, um, say I'm on, on the input layer, I will consider that for this layer, my input activations, for every output of that um, network, the output activations, I will have a weight for each input. So in a typical fully connected um, layer, like the fully connected layers in AlexNet, there are 4,096 input activations, 4,096 output activations, and 16 million weights. Um, and for a single inference moving forward, that fully connected layer will basically do a matrix vector multiply. I'll take the 16, uh, take the 4K input weights, multiply them basically doing a dot product of the input weights with each row of this matrix, and the results of each of those dot products um, give me one of the output weights. So a, you know, a um, 16, 16 million multiply um, matrix uh, vector multiplication. Now, after I've done this for one layer, my input weights, my output weights become the input weights of the next layer, and I just do it over again until I've done all the layers of the network. And if I'm um, doing training, I then do the same thing backwards, where um, once I've computed a, a gradient at the output weights, I basically apply the chain rule um, to compute the gradient at the input weights, summing the con contributions of each of the, um, of, of the, uh, of the output 
um, neurons multiplied by their weights to get the input neurons. It's just a matrix vector um, multipl multiplication again, except now the vector is gradients rather than activations. It's the same weight matrix. And I also need to produce the partials with respect to the weights um, for weight update. Typically, if I'm not worried about real-time constraints, I will batch this problem. By batching, I mean that I will take uh, many images and put them all together and run them through the network as a unit. And the reason I do this is to get reuse out of this matrix. If I do matrix vector multiplication without batching, um, I basically have to fetch this entire matrix. It's 16 million weights. It's too big to fit in the, um, the cache of, of modern CPUs or GPUs. So I basically have to fetch this entire matrix, and I use every element of that matrix exactly once. I multiply you know, Wij um, by Aj to produce Bi, and then I'm done with Wij. I don't touch it again. So I have a ratio of one word loaded from memory for each multiply. And that's horribly mismatched to modern um, computer engines, which typically want a ratio of more like you know, 10 to 50 um, arithmetic operations per word loaded from DRAM. So to get that ratio up, we will typically batch the operations. And now instead of a matrix vector multiplication, I've turned both the forward and backward steps into a matrix matrix multiplication. And I get a reuse out of this matrix that's equal to the, the, the narrow width uh, of this matrix, which is here k, the batch size. Um, but in real time, I can't batch. So I'm back to um, doing a matrix vector multiplication Moreover, if I'm really trying to optimize my system, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, I will exploit sparsity. There is sparsity in both the um, activations and in the weights. Um, the sparsity in the activations comes, and I'm showing it um, the reverse direction picture here, but in the forward direction, um, after I've done my, um, my matrix vector product, I apply a nonlinear operator, very often a, um, a rectified linear unit, and that rectified linear unit, because it clips off the bottom part of the response at zero, um, I'll typically have something on the order of um, a third to two thirds of the activations to be zero. And so it uh, would be a horrible waste to do three times as much work as I needed to do by multiplying all of those zeros. So I can exploit sparsity by only multiplying by the weights that are not only, only by multiplying by the weights that are non-zero. I'll also show um, later in this talk how it's possible to prune the fully connected layers to remove about 90% of their weights. Um, and this is true both for networks like uh, AlexNet and VGGNet for images, as well as for networks like NeuralTalk um, for um, dealing with, with natural language processing. Um, and I, as a result, I can eliminate another 10x of the work that needed to be done. So if I'm really worried about efficiency, this isn't a dense matrix times dense vector, vector operation. It's a sparse matrix times sparse vector operation, which is among the hardest operations to do efficiently because there's irregularity there. The irregularity on the vector side is actually dynamic. I get a different set of non-zeros um, in the vector every, um, every image, and the, the irregularity on the matrix side is static. Uh, once I've pruned the fully connected layer, the non-zeros in the matrix remain, uh, rather the zeros in the matrix remain zeros, the non-zeros remain where they are. So that's for the fully connected layers of, of a network, and for um, the recurrent neural networks we see for speech, for a lot of the natural language uh, networks, they're essentially all fully connected layers. Um, even for um, uh, convolutional networks for images, um, the fully connected layers are very important. The bulk of the arithmetic operations actually happen in the convolutional layers, but the bulk of the memory operations happen in the um, fully connected layers, and, and very often we wind up being memory limited, especially with a batch size um, of one. Also, there's a move today to basically run the convolutional layers at the front end of networks like AlexNet and VGGNet once, and then run multiple detections on the back end repeatedly using the same set of features that were learned by running the conv layers once um, on many sets of fully connected layers for different detections. Um, but, the, but the convolutional layers are also important, and so for the um, um, image nets, um, we tend to run the first several layers as trained feature detectors. To me, this is you know, really revolutionary. I have colleagues who spent their entire career sort of designing um, you know, hand-tuned feature detectors for different computer vision problems. And all that work is now completely obsolete because um, neural networks just completely outperform all of the hand-tuned feature detectors uh, across the board on computer vision problems. And what the, the work is to do here is we take a piece of our image and we basically uh, multiply it by a kernel, essentially taking a dot product of, of a 2D 
chunk of the image by the kernel, and then that produces one pixel of a feature map. Um, I, I will typically, after the first, um, let me pop back here, typically after the first layer, I will have a number of different feature maps. Very often these are called channels. Um, when I do my next convolution, I basically do a convolution, it's really a 3D convolution now, by X and Y in the feature map and Z over the channels um, by a filter to produce uh, an output feature map. And as I get deeper in the network, while the X and Y dimensions of these feature maps tend to get smaller, I tend to have more parallel feature maps, more channels um, that are done in parallel. And I get down to the point where I um, have the last uh, fully connected layer, and then I, I basically drop into a set of, last convolutional layer, and I drop into a fully connected layer to do the classification on the set of features that I just learned. Um, so in addition to the matrix times vector multiply, which is the key operation of the fully connected layers, um, the other key operation that we need if we're doing a convolutional network is doing convolutions. And um, basically just doing this um, convolve of a kernel over the input image. And I'll talk about later in, in this talk about how uh, very often before you accelerate things by trying to throw great hardware at it, it's important to make sure you're using the best possible algorithm. Um, a brute force convolution requires uh, a number of multiplies equal to the uh, non-zero support in, in the convolution kernel. So if I have a k by k kernel um, here, I basically have to multiply every, um, uh, to, to compute each image point, I have to multiply um, k by k points of the input image by the kernel. And so I wind up doing k squared multiplications for each point in the um, output map for each output map. Um, I'll talk about later how by doing transformations before doing these multiplies, I can reduce that k squared multiplications to one multiplication. But, but for now, let's, let's continue thinking about the brute force approach. If we do the brute force approach, um, this convolution is really a six dimensional loop. So basically the dimensions are the output maps, since I have some number of channels of the output, and the input maps, since I have some number of channels of the input, and then I have each pixel of that, input, of that input map, x, y. And then I have each element of the kernel, u, v. So I basically have a six uh, deep nested loop at the very bottom of which I'm doing a multiply and accumulate of that kernel. So this is computationally very intensive. It tends not to be as memory intensive because I'm sharing the weights. In the fully connected layers, I'm fetching each weight, if, unless I'm batching, I'm fetching each weight and I'm using it for one multiply. Here I can fetch a kernel of weights and then scan it over the entire input image. And so I wind up being able to reuse that weight, basically multiplied by the size of the input image. So I wind up, wind up being multiply limited in convolutional layers, whereas I'm typically memory limited without batching in the um, fully connected layers. For um, speech networks and certain um, natural language processing networks, we see a lot of recurrent neural networks. And these are really just fully connected layers where we've folded them back on themselves. Um, so that basically for each of the um, elements of this recurrent layer, in addition to having connections from the pre preceding set of activations and the next set of activations, they have connections back to themselves via a set of, of um, activations that basically form a short-term memory for the network. But for the sake of, of the processing demands, the hardware requirements of doing recurrent neural networks, they're basically no different than, than doing a fully connected layer. Um, now we do need some other operations to plug our network together, um, but they tend to, you need to be able to do them and not, and not have horrible performance on them, but they tend not to be limiting. Um, the first is, is, is a pooling um, operation, where very often um, in the convolutional stages, I'll reduce the size of my um, input filters from one stage to the next by taking four adjacent um, pixels that I've computed and, um, for example, taking the maximum of them if I'm doing max pooling. So I have to be able to, to efficiently um, pool my, my network. And, and um, this lets me reduce the size of, of the image from stage to sa stage and gives you a certain amount of location invariance in your feature detectors, since detecting a feature in any one of these four quadrants will give you the same response in, in the next set of channels. Um, um, typically, um, after pooling, I'll do a nonlinear operation where I will apply, um, you know, his, for many years, people would use a, a hyperbolic tangent or sigmoid um, operation here because that was thought to have all sorts of great properties. Um, and then at some point in time, um, people started using ReLU um, and found that it actually worked better. And ReLU is really easy to implement. It's basically 
Um, if, if your input is less than zero, output zero. If your input is more than zero, um, output your input. Many people will do a clip ReLU where they'll also put a max on this. So it'll actually be um, zero and then a you know, unit slope up to the maximum and then, then at that maximum for a certain point in time. And then if I'm training, I also have to update the weights. Um, and this winds up being a critical operation simply because there, there are a lot of weights. You may have, for a complex network like VGGNet, several hundred million weights. And, and so you need to manage the uh, memory to be able to update these without exceeding your memory bandwidth. Um, if you accelerate everything that goes on in, in the neural network itself, um, very often you'll find that some other part of your overall data center system or embedded system, if, if this is an embedded application, um, will, uh, will be dominant. So for example, if I'm doing image um, training, I have to make sure that I can fetch the images from whatever storage they're on if the images are on disk, I have to be cognizant of what the maximum bandwidth of the disks are, or that can become a limiting factor. Very often people actually um, store them in DRAM spread over the data center to avoid the disk access. Um, I then have to decompress them. So for example, if I want to classify this eagle image here, this is an eagle plucking a fish out of the water, um, it'll start out in JPEG form. And I have to make sure I have enough decompression compute capability to decompress my training images, because I'm not going to store them in decompressed format. That's, it takes way too much storage for that. So I have to decompress them. Then I'll do the acceleration of the deep neural network, and then I'll produce an output. Maybe this was like the neural talk network where I'll label um, the image eagle grabbing a fish from water. Um, and I'll have to do something with whatever the output is. And so if you do a really good job at this box, it then often creates problems for you doing a good job at the rest of the things in the data center. But that's a high class problem to have. And for the remainder of this talk, I'm going to concentrate on the box here labeled DNN and assume that you've done a good job with the rest of the infrastructure. So to sum up the problem we're solving, um, our goal is to be able to run multiple types of, of deep learning networks, um, fully connected deep neural networks, convolutional neural networks, and recurrent neural networks, and various combinations of the above um, for both training and inference in both latency and latency insensitive ways. Um, and we'll be able to batch if, if we're not latency sensitive. And I want to optimize both speed, because if I'm a developer, very often what I'm concerned about is I'm trying you know, to develop a new network. I'm experimenting with a lot of different hyperparameters. I don't want to have to wait a month to find out if my great idea on these hyperparameters gave better accuracy or worth, worse accuracy than the old way of doing it. I'd like to get that turnaround in at most a few days. Um, and also efficiency, because ultimately uh, in the data center, I'm limited by the cost of, of the installation and by the energy it takes. Um, the key operations I need to accelerate are matrix times vector for the fully connected layers. If I can batch, I will turn that into a sort of tall, skinny matrix times matrix, basically a square matrix times a tall, skinny matrix. Um, and if I can't batch, it will remain a matrix by, by vector. And if I um, exploit the sparsity, both the dynamic sparsity of the activations and the static sparsity of, of the weight matrix, um, it actually turns into a sparse vector times sparse matrix operation, which leads to a lot of irregularity that I need to deal with. Um, for the convolutional networks, I also need to do convolutions, either with the brute force k squared method, or as we'll talk about later, with one of the um, transform-based methods. It basically reduces that to, um, to basically a single multiplier per, per image point. Um, and then between the layers, I also have to do things like pooling and nonlinear operators. And, and for um, training, I need to do weight update. So let's start out um, by setting a baseline. If I was simply to um, take you know, an average data center machine and load CAFE on it um, and use the um, Intel um, deep learning framework, uh, what kind of performance will I get? So this is the baseline against which I'm going to um, measure everything else um, in this talk. Um, a uh, single processor of a Xeon E5-2698, and that means absolutely nothing to me or to anybody else, I'm sure. But what, what this is, is it's sort of a standard Intel data center processor. This is a hexadecacore processor, as Intel refers to it on their web page, which means it has 16 cores. Um, I'm going to use just one of them, um, run, uh, run Cafe, and I'm going to get 30 frames per second and 3.2 um, frames per joule, basically frames per watt second. Um, now, I will point out is if you actually ran this on just the CPU, it would be an order of magnitude, actually maybe more like a factor of 30 worse than this. Uh, in both performance and in energy um, uh, per frame. And, and the reason is, is that even when you're just running on the CPU, um, CPUs are horribly matched for this job. Um, but the AVX units, the SIMD units on the CPUs, 
um, do way better um, than the CPUs do on it. So actually most of the ops, if you're running CAFE or one of the other deep learning frameworks on a CPU, are not happening on the CPU itself, but are happening on the SIMD units. Now a lot of people would say, well, I'll just wait until next year and buy another chip from Intel if this isn't fast enough. And, and for many years that worked, but it doesn't work anymore. Um, and and I, I give whole talks about, about the end of Moore's Law, and I don't have time in the two hours here to do that. Um, but I'll sort of summarize a lot of um, what is both the end of Moore's Law and the end of what's called Denard scaling, which is really what's led to the, to the end of performance scaling for CPUs, um, with this slide, which was presented by Chuck Moore. Um, Moore's Law is due to Gordon Moore, um, who was one of the founders of Intel. Chuck Moore um, actually died a few years ago, but before he died, he was CTO of AMD. And he presented this slide at the Salishan meeting um, in 2011. And what it shows is scaling of CPUs in a number of dimensions from 1975 to 2011, which is when the slide was done. Um, and what you'll notice is during this, um, the really important curve here is the blue one, because that's performance on specint, which is actually a pretty good um, proxy for, for things like, like um, neural networks, so the spec FP would probably be a little bit better. What you see is that from 1990, where you got about 100 spec int um, out of a single CPU core, um, to the present, roughly, you know, say 2010 uh, on this slide, because it's pretty much flattened out, where you get about um, 30,000 spec int, you got a factor of 300 um, in, in 15 years. In fact, you got most of that 300 in, ten, in, uh, in you, know, you got about 100 in 10 years, and then a factor of three in the, in the, in the following um, 10. Um, you know, a factor of 110 years is not going to happen again. Um, we're now over 10 years um, going to get maybe a factor of two. Um, so we're not getting the performance that we got at one point in time. I will point out that the number of transistors per chip is still going up. That's actually the top line here. And that's what the original Moore's Law was all about. Um, the popular version of Moore's Law, though, is really about this blue line, which is about performance. And the reason why it's not going up the way it used to is because while the original Moore's Law, the number of transistors per chip is still scaling just fine. Um, the popular version of Moore's Law really depended on something called Denard scaling, which basically reduced voltages as we made the devices smaller. And that allowed us to get more energy efficiency building the same thing in a smaller process technology. We no longer scale voltage with, with process technology the way we did up until about 2005. You'll notice that's when a lot of things start to flatten out here. And because of that, the gains we get going from one generation of process technology to the next, which used to be about a factor of three per generation, a factor of eight over two generations, which is uh, cutting the linear dimension in half, is now more like a factor of 1.2 per generation, and perhaps a factor of about 1.5 over, over, over a pair of generations, cutting the, um, the feature size in half. So without Moore's Law, how are we going to continue to scale the performance we need to basically build even better um, deep, deep neural networks as we get larger data sets, we're going to want to build ne networks with more capacity to be able to, to train um, with those data sets and to get even better um, accuracy and ch to tackle more challenging problems. So I'm going to um, go through, for the rest of this talk, a bunch of ways of doing that. Um, the first is how to do things in parallel. Then we, we apply our silver bullet of GPUs. We'll talk about reducing the precision of the computation, um, um, compressing the networks, using better algorithms, and then finally, the, at the last resort, going to special purpose hardware for deep neural networks. So the first rule is if you want to go faster, use more processors. If you look at the problem of, of computing an inference for deep neural network, it is what the parallel computing community refers to as an embarrassingly parallel problem. Well, I don't get embarrassed by very much, so I just refer to it as an easily parallelizable problem. Um, I don't find it embarrassing at all. We have many dimensions of parallelism here. Um, we have parallelism over the input set. This is what's often called data parallelism. If I have a large training set, I can basically run different GPUs on different images in parallel, and I simply have to combine um, the, the weight updates at some point um, so that they learn from what each other have seen. Um, points in a feature map. I've got a large input image here. I can dice that input image up and have different um, CPUs or GPUs work on different parts of, of the Im input image, or, or more accurately, you really want them to work on different parts of the output feature map for their layer. Uh, but it's a very local computation, so to compute, say I quarter my output feature map here, I basically quarter my input feature map, but I have a little halo hanging over each, each one of those that, that has to be shared 
uh, between the processors that are working on that. Um, when I get to the fully connected layers, I have 16 million multiplies that are completely independent. So if I had 16 million processors, I could do those all in parallel. Um, I would then have a tree reduction to do um, with, um, um, with the uh, summing, summing them up to get the output activations. In fact, the only data dependencies here are from layer to layer. I have to compute one layer before doing the next. But if I don't care about latency, if I'm doing um, training or if I have a latency insensitive in inference task, I can even pipeline over the layers, which is another form of parallelism. Um, and it, there's um, no data dependent operations until I start to exploit sparsity. So in fact, it's an entirely static computation. I can spend lots of time at compile time and schedule this all um, completely deterministically before I start the computation because there's no if statements um, in here that are based on stuff. Um, so the first approach is data parallelism. It's by far the easiest to do. Um, you, you train on one GPU and it takes you a week. You want to get down to three and a half days. Um, you basically buy two GPUs. You take half your data set and run it on one, half your data set and run it on the other. Now, these aren't two completely separate computations because I need to share the weight updates. And so I'll take my, my mini batch size, say I do a mini batch size of 256, and I'll run 128 down each pipeline. Um, and at the end of that mini batch, I have to share the weight updates from one pipeline to the other pipeline. So they've all learned the same thing, even though they only saw half the images they've learned from both halves of the images. Um, and I can uh, continue this. People have successfully applied data parallelism um, up to 128 GPUs, and I'll show you some data on that in, in a few slides. Um, so um, this doesn't affect the latency for any one input, but it does require a p-fold larger batch size. So if I'm exploiting p-fold parallelism, if I have p GPUs working in parallel, and I need, say, a minimum batch size of eight images um, to make um, each uh, GPU work efficiently, I now need 8P images in my mini batch size. So for example, if I want to run an 8 GPUs and my mini batch size is um, 64 images, I'll be running 8 on each GPU, and that's still a pretty efficient operating point. Um, and then um, for training, I need to coordinate the weight update. So across these different ones, after I do my back propagation on each mini batch, um, I have to take my um, weights and exchange them. And there are two ways to do this. Um, this is a figure from uh, Jeff Dean's paper from 2013 on large-scale distributed deep networks where they use the notion of a parameter server. Um, there's you know, one server in their network that's responsible for all the weights. Um, after each forward and backward step with a mini batch, each of the, the, the workers, think of that as each of the GPUs working on a part of the um, data set, sends their delta parameters, their change in weights from, from the um, gradient back prop propagation over that entire batch up to the parameter server. The parameter server um, gets everybody's deltas, adds them to the weights, calculates the new weights, and sends them back to everybody. And you can do this in a slightly asynchronous fashion. So rather than having these workers wait for the update before they start on the next uh, go, they can start on the next mini batch and, and basically be slightly out of, out of sync. And there's various um, effects of that on your learning rate, but, but most people will do an asynchronous update here. Some people will insist on doing it synchronously, um, which has certain complications. The other approach to doing this, you eliminate the parameter server, and you simply exchange the weights directly between the model workers. Um, and very often you'll, for example, connect them in a ring um, where everybody will send just their fraction um, of, of the delta at the first step of the ring, and then they'll accumulate send theirs and the one they received on the next and go all the way around the ring until everybody has received everybody's deltas um, around the ring. Um, so that's um, data parallelism where I split my input uh, training set up and divide it over some number of, of worker GPUs. The, the next approach is model parallelism where in a di and I can apply these two together. I can do data parallelism and model parallelism at the same time. But model parallelism is exploiting parallelism within the model itself. And so let's look at how this works in the two types of layers. Um, in the um, convolutional layers, the best way to do model parallelism, um, if I look at my six-dimensional loop, is to do it over, you can think of I have six, uh, six um, nested loops, and I want to take um, you know, one or two of those dimensions and split them across GPUs. The best dimensions to split across the GPUs are the output map coordinates, what I'm calling x, y here. And the reason that's the case is that these computations are entirely um, uh, independent. So I can compute um, the, the green region of an output feature map 
completely independent of the red region of the output feature map. And they also um, are um, relatively local in the input data they use. The red region of this feature map uses sort of its area in the input feature map plus a halo, which is equal to one less than the width and height of the convolutional kernel, um, um, I should have the convolutional kernel within there. So for example, if I have a three by three convolutional kernel, this halo is of width one. Um, so I basically need one pixel from the other side of, of, the, uh, of the map to compute the red area. Um, but after I've used that level of, of um, model parallelism for the convolutional layers, I can continue going. And the next dimension that's worth exploiting is to compute the different output maps in parallel. Um, here now, I need to share data, right? The, the blue output map needs the entire input data set, as does the red um, output map. But the output computations are still entirely um, independent. And I can combine these, basically, um, first dividing in X and Y, and then dividing over maps and get very high degrees of parallelism um, in the convolutional layers. Um, for the fully connected layers, the right way to exploit uh, model parallelism is to divide up the activations. Um, and in this way, I can basically say I compute the tan activations um, on one GPU and the purple activations on another GPU. I can split the weight matrix um, completely. There's no sharing here. Um, and so the, the heavy part of the data fetch is now split across um, those two. And all I have to do is distribute the input activations to both of them. But that's a relatively inexpensive thing to do. Remember, I have 16 million elements of the weight matrix and only 4,000 activations. Um, so sending those 4,000 activations to both GPUs is not a large overhead, double the speed at which I do this, this computation. And then the most effective way of exploiting um, parallelism is what's called hyperparameter um, parallelism. Very often when I'm, I'm doing a study, I'm trying to experiment to find the right set of hyperparameters. How many layers, what size convolutional kernels, um, how many um, hidden uh, neurons in, in each of the fully connected layers. And um, you think of this as a parameter space to search to find the optimal network. Um, I want to search this hyperparameter space. What I'll do is I'll have, have a bunch of trial networks that I think will give me better results, either more efficiency or better accuracy or hopefully both. And I will run those trial networks in parallel on multiple GPUs. And these are completely independent runs. Um, they may share some of the infrastructure of, of image um, uh, decoding and the like. So first, let's apply this um, to our CPU parallelism. Um, and here I'm going to go to a Core i7. This is a, a consumer CPU, maybe like the one you would find in a um, desktop uh, PC. Um, and one core versus six cores in the Core uh, i7, you get essentially linear speed up. And in fact, a good parallelization um, you know, we'll, we'll typically get very close to linear speed up, um, up to a reasonable number of, of things. Um, this was almost entirely data parallelism, by the way. Um, if you're trying to do model parallelism, though, your results may vary. This is a, um, a chart taken from uh, a, uh, another Jeff Dean paper, this one in NIPS 2012. And what he shows is if you're trying um, to just get model parallelism, this is machines per model instance, um, the parallelism at least um, uh, what he saw was quite low for the speech uh, network, for example, with 40, oops, I somehow managed to go backwards there. Um, the speech network with you know, 42 million parameters, um, at eight GPUs, um, you're going maybe um, you know, two or three times as fast, um, and then it actually gets worse. And this is, a, this is an example of overhead. Um, we have these um, neural networks which have enormous amounts of parallelism in them. I should be able to get model parallelism um, on the level of thousands out of a network. Um, and in fact, I'm already exploiting some of that. I mean, this is running, um, well, in 2012, it's probably running on CPUs. But if I'm running on CPUs, I'm running on the um, AVX units. I'm already exploiting the width of those AVX units times their pipeline depth. There's probably a factor of 32 or so parallels I'm already exploiting um, in the CPU. If I'm running on GPUs, within one GPU, I have thousands of CUDA cores. I'm exploiting on the order of you know, 3,000 or so parallelism just within the CPU. It's additional parallelism I need on top of that to get multiple going in parallel. So just to sum up um, uh, the parallelism section of this talk, um, there's lots of parallelism in deep neural networks. If it wasn't for the overhead, let me pop back to this slide, if it wasn't for the overhead of communicating the parameter updates and sharing the input data of, of model sharing where I, I'm doing model parallelism rather than data parallelism, 
um, I should be able to, to get essentially linear speed up, up to very large numbers of processors. Um, but what you see here is that there is overhead. Sometimes this overhead is fundamental. Um, it's a limit of the actual physical hardware. Um, more often, it's actually artificial. And it's basically overhead that's introduced by the programming system um, that's used. So for example, if the only way I can exchange parameters is by sending a, a, me a message over you know, Ethernet network, the, the uh, TCP IP stack is probably the single largest source of overhead. Um, the actual hardware is way faster. Um, and people will typically try to batch up large updates uh, to amortize that enormous overhead of, of the software stack. Um, that's one reason why if you have, for example, if you're running an 8-GPU system um, that are all together on one PCIe bus or through a PLX switch, um, they can actually read and write the memory um, of, the, of the other GPUs doing what's called peer-to-peer -peer, um, without having to go through any um, system software. There's no operating system call required. And you can get very efficient weight sharing. Um, that way. So it's really important when you're trying to exploit parallelism to accelerate um, deep neural networks, or actually to accelerate any problem, to make sure the way when you do have to do communication and synchronization between parts of your computation, that you do that communication and synchronization in a way that overhead, and particularly unnecessary software overhead, um, does not swamp the actual computation. So there's lots of parallelism, 16 million independent multiplies in each fully connected layer. Um, you know, thousands of, of um, updates that can be done simultaneously in convolutional layers. Um, and so you can split the model up many ways and exploit a lot of parallelism. And that's actually why we're able to get good speed up on, on parallel units like GPUs to begin with. But you can go beyond that and split it over multiple GPUs. Um, the easiest way to exploit parallelism is just to break your data set up. Um, if you're training, um, you can easily split your data set up and, and train on um, you know, different examples in parallel, and then um, share, share the parameter updates, either via parameter server or by exchanging um, in a ring or some other um, topology. And this is largely limited by batch size. The larger the mini batch you're, you're willing to do, the more GPUs you can split um, your, your data parallel training over. Um, very often people will do things like a batch size of 256 um, divided over 16 GPUs for, for a batch of 16 per GPU. Um, uh, you can do model parallelism, where you then split the model up over the GPUs, um, splitting it by layer, the convolutional layers by the regions of the output maps for that layer, and the fully connected layers by output activation. And it's very, very easy to get, um, say, 64 GPUs working on one problem by basically splitting a model over eight GPUs and then copying that unit and doing um, data parallelism over eight copies of that unit. Um, so let me get to my favorite topic of this outline. You notice it's central being right in the middle of, of the outline, um, which are GPUs. GPUs are just really cool. Um, and so the, the, the sort of repeat you know, from the parallelism session, if you want to go fast, use multiple processors. If you want to be both fast and efficient, use GPUs. And I'll, I'll show some data shortly to sort of back up the claim that they're both fast and efficient. And actually, if you want to be really um, fast and efficient, um, use multiple GPUs because I can take all the parallelism tricks and apply them to GPUs as well. So um, the, the sort of gold standard uh, for doing neural network training now and, and will be until uh, our next GPUs come out um, is Titan X or its Tesla equivalent, the M40, um, is um, uh, 3,072 CUDA cores running at one gigahertz. Um, this is six teraflops of single precision floating point. Uh, just to put this in perspective, um, I've been you know, playing with, with supercomputers for longer than I would like to admit. And in the early 90s, um, there was a, a really big deal when um, the machines, on the number one machine on the top 500 list hit one teraflop. At that point in time, um, you know, one teraflop was the fastest machine in the world. Um, now, roughly 20 years later, um, you can buy one of these for $1,000 and have something which is six times faster than the fastest machine in the world in, in 1993. I believe that was like a Connection Machine 5, the CM5 at Los Alamos. Um, and um, what, what's amazing is that that machine was like a 5 um, megawatt machine. Um, this is a 250 watt machine uh, with six times its performance. So 24 gigaflops per watt is just amazing level of efficiency um, compared to what you can do elsewhere. Um, uh, to put that in perspective, a CPU, if you don't use the AVX unit, is less than one gigaflop per watt. Um, if you use the AVX units, they're around five-ish. Um, 
I think they're about a half a gigaflop per watt just running on the CPU part of the CPU. Um, this, is, uh, this is a Maxwell uh, GM200 GPU. I, I had a lot of fun with various parts of, of it. Um, and it's in a 28 nanometer process. And, and I'll make sort of a comment here about Moore's Law. Um, our previous generation of GPUs, Kepler, um, so the, you know, the, the you know, K20, K40, and K80 are all Kepler generation GPUs, is also in a 28 nanometer process. Um, the Maxwell generation GPUs like um, the Titan X and, and the M40 are in the same process. They, they are almost exactly twice the performance at the same power level, twice the performance per watt with no process change. So Moore's Law, the process isn't giving us any more performance or performance per watt, but with GPUs, we're able to double our performance per watt over a generation um, within the same process. And that's why GPUs are, are able to do so well at this. So if you're um, doing either inference in the data center or training networks, Titan X is um, you know, for, the, for the next period of time, at least, the right GPU for you. Um, if you're doing Internet of Things or automotive or you're doing some embedded application where you need to do inference at very efficient power levels in a small space, um, we, we build a Tegra line of SOCs. SOC means system on chip. These are not just the GPU, but also the CPU. We, we have um, ARM cores, both of our own design and some that are licensed uh, from ARM. Um, so this basically has 256 CUDA cores at a gigahertz. Um, it has eight ARM cores, um, four bigs and four littles. I think the bigs are A57s and the littles are A53s. Um, um, it's a teraflop of FP16. And yes, that's not a typo. And I'll talk when I get to the limited uh, reduced precision part about why that's exactly the right thing for deep learning. Um, and uh, you know, four gigabytes of LPDDR, that, that gives you 25 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth. By the way, I should have gone back on Titan. Um, for things that are memory bandwidth limited, compared to the sort of you know, 50 or 60 gigabytes per second you get out of a CPU, one of the big advantages of GPUs is the 300 gigabytes per second you have to the GDDR5 uh, memory there. Um, and what's neat about this is that you know, it's sort of 10 watt typical power dissipation. This is 100 gigaflops per watt. That's just an astounding level of, of energy efficiency. And this is actually in a slightly more modern process than, than the uh, Titan X. It's in a 20 nanometer um, process. So to, to sort of justify my comment that um, if you want to go fast and efficient, um, use the CPU. Um, this compares the data center processor I used as the baseline, the uh, Xeon E5. Um, to a Titan X. Um, and what you see, and I've shown both for, for no batching and batching, and this sort of shows why um, if you don't have the really hard latency constraint, you want to batch things. Um, if I batch, um, I'm limited across the 16 cores, uh, this, is, this is all 16 cores of the um, E5 to 476 frames per second, whereas I get over 3,000 on the Titan X, so it's about a 7X improvement in performance. Um, and on power efficiency, um, it's about 4.4x. And I will note that that 4.4x, part of the power I'm charging to the Titan here is the power for the E5 connected to it. Um, even though that E5 is really not doing much other than loading um, image data sets um, and firing off kernels on the, uh, uh, on the Titan X. It's actually, if I was just counting the Titan X, the number would be almost twice that good. Um, if I'm doing um, embedded applications, I'll compare here a, a Tegra X1 to the Core i7. The Tegra X1, which is a little SOC intended to be embedded into IoT things, actually slightly outperforms at 10 watts, slightly outperforms a Core i7 at about 60. Um, and an energy efficiency, it's more than 10x. It's 11.5x on, on frames per joule. Um, so you get great both performance and performance per watt um, out of GPUs. And the reason is, is that they eliminate a lot of the overhead that's found in CPUs. CPUs basically have enormous amounts of hardware that's all there to handle the problem that when you do a memory load operation, you don't know whether it's going to hit in the cache and take three cycles or go all the way out to DRAM and take hundreds. And because of that, they actually, no matter how much work your compiler did to schedule the computation beforehand, they reschedule the computation in hardware at runtime every time around the loop. And that's, comp that's computationally very intensive and energetically very intensive. GPUs, on the other hand, have exactly the same problem of unpredictable data latency. You don't know whether something's going to hit in the L1 cache or the L2 cache. You have to go all the way up to DRAM. But we handle the problem in an entirely different way. When we basically have a cache miss, 
we switch threads. We're a multi-threaded architecture. And because of that, we're able to deal with this problem with essentially no overhead. We can have the vast majority of the joules consumed in a GPU go to actually doing the arithmetic operations and essential memory operations. It's actually, uh, you know, almost within a factor of two of the, of the total power is going into things you, that you have to do. You can't do without. And when I get to special purpose hardware, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so once you have one GPU, you may, you may want to ask, um, how does it do to, to um, do more in parallel? Um, so this is um, a, a, a set of data due to Baidu on image um, recognition from uh, archive last year. I realize this group was later discredited because they were making too many submissions, but I don't think it affected their speed up results. And what you can see is that they were getting essentially linear speed up, um, you know, up to 64 GPUs um, on a single model. Um, and this really had to do, again, as I said before, with batch size. Um, if you ran a really big batch size, it was actually super linear speed up. And this has to do with um, um, basically reuse of data. You wind up um, having to get less, um, less memory bandwidth um, if you do that. Um, but at reasonable batch sizes, um, even batch, a batch size of 256, um, they were still getting um, ver very good speed up, if not quite um, linear. Um, the um, a more recent result, this is something which is um, hot off the press. In fact, it may not actually be up on archive yet, but um, I was uh, given a pre-release uh, pre uh, version of Baidu's Deep Speech 2 um, paper, um, and, this, um, and they gave me permission to use figure four out of the paper. Um, this is figure four, which basically shows training a recurrent um, neural network um, for speech um, from you know, one to 128 GPUs. Oh, I hate it when it does that. Um, if I went way back, hold on just a second here. Yeah. No, I actually went forward, okay. Looked fair. Um, so from 1 to 128 GPUs, I'm going to stop trying to use the mouse because it thinks I'm trying to advance slides. From 1 to 128 GPUs, and, and what you see is that this is essentially linear speed up. Um, it just, um, ah, no, no, no mouse. Um, it's linear speed up. They um, basically start at taking um, you know, roughly 2 to the 18th seconds and wind up at around 2 to the 12th. Um, you know, so they're um, much closer to 2 to the 11th to this network. So they're you know, essentially able to get 128 fold speed up on 128 GPUs. I will say that this was holding the batch per GPU constant at 64 across this. So the batch sizes at the right side of this graph are probably larger than reasonable and will probably adversely affect their, their uh, rate of convergence. Uh, but certainly um, in the middle of the graph, uh, so get, this is advancing to the next slide, um, in the middle of the graph, um, those are, will still have very reasonable learning rates. Um, so let me summarize GPUs. Um, you, um, you know, for um, you know, training in the data center, inference in the data center, a Titan X is, is um, roughly six times faster and four times more efficient um, than, than a top of the line Xeon E5. And I will point out that that's even though it's actually two generations of technology back, um, that M M uh, GM200 chip in Titan X is in 28 nanometer. Um, the latest um, um, Intel uh, server processors are in 14. Um, so um, that's actually two, two X in uh, line width is two, two process generations, um, and, and we're still um, you know, uh, smoking them. Um, and the, uh, for embedded applications, a, a TX1 is 11 and a half times more efficient than, than a Core i7, and that's one generation back in technology, being at the 20 nanometer node. Um, and these are both on inference, they're actually slightly larger gains um, on training. Um, and then if that's not enough performance for you, um, data parallelism scales easily to 16 GPUs, and then you can use model parallelism eight ways across that and get to 128 GPUs with pretty close to linear speed up. So to put this in perspective, um, if I run 128 GPUs versus a Core i7 CPU with six cores, um, that's 870 times speed up. Um, and what this does is it turns a month into a little less than an hour. Um, so GPUs are really time machines. Um, they turn months into hours, and there are very few things in life that'll that'll do that. And so, you know, um, especially if you're doing something iterative, where you're trying to to uh, experiment with hyperparameters and find out whether your latest set of hyperparameters works or not, um, being able to get turnaround in hours is just a huge thing. But we can do better than that. So let's go back to our outline and talk about precision. Up until now, all of the results I've been showing you assume that you do the entire computation in 32-bit floating point. Um, and in fact, you don't need to use 32-bit floating point. That's more precision than is required um, for the operation. Um, 
So I can do a, lo a lot better by reducing precision. If I reduce precision, first of all, I reduce storage. If I only need to store 16 bits per weight rather than 32 bits, I just reduce the amount of memory capacity I need by a factor of two, and more importantly, the amount of memory bandwidth I need by a factor of two. It reduces the energy. Um, uh, dominant at that is actually the data transfer energy by moving this data around, because I only need to move half the data around, less if I can get down to eight or four bits. Um, and it improves performance. And up to a point, it has little effect on accuracy, and I'll show some results for that. So let's go back to our dense neural network and ask the question, um, we really have a bunch of different things that we do. We have activations, we have weights, and we have intermediate results when I'm sort of summing um, the dot product for the activations times the weights. So how much ac accuracy do I need um, when I'm doing these sums and when I'm doing the weight updates? And um, my sort of menu, or if you want to think about it, the color palette I have to draw from in, in deciding how to do, do this, looks something like this. Um, this is sort of the data formats for both floating point numbers and fixed point numbers. And um, floating point numbers are, are wonderful things because they have an enormous dynamic range. A 32-bit floating point number um, has a dynamic range of 76 orders of magnitude, from 10 to the minus 38 to 10 to the 38. It's way more than you need. But what I'll observe is that a 16-bit floating point number has a dynamic range of nine orders of magnitude. It's the same dynamic range as a 32-bit fixed point number. So if you could do a computation with a 32-bit fixed point number, um, you can pretty much do the same computation um, with a 16-bit uh, floating point number. And the accuracy here is basically the quantization error you get by taking an, an element of the real number line and representing it by one of these number systems. The accuracies for floating point numbers I give in percent because the error you get changes as the scale changes. When I try to represent very small numbers, the spacing between them is very small. So I wind up with, you know, whatever this is, you know, um, six you know, millionths of a percent um, error um, in, um, in a floating point number, whether I'm trying to represent, you know, 10 to the minus 30 or 10 to the 30th. The size of my error scales. It always winds up being 60 parts per billion. The, um, um, similarly, I have five hundredths uh, of um, a percent error with a 16-bit floating point number, regardless of where I am in that range. Not so with fixed point numbers. With fixed point numbers, my error is a half across that entire range, right? Because it's the same spacing between numbers. I don't have an exponent, so the spacing between the representations doesn't change. And so your quantization noise with fixed point numbers gets very large when you get to the low end of the range, and is usually acceptable at the high end of the range. Um, right, so the, the, the difference between the two largest numbers in this floating point range is basically about one part per billion. The difference between two, the two smallest numbers in, in the fixed point range of a 32-bit fixed point number is a half. Right, the difference between a, a, a real number and what I would round it to is round to nearest. Um, but th this is sort of what I can choose from. Um, you know, float, float 32, float 16, um, and 32, 16, and 8-bit integer. And I'll actually be looking at some 4-bit representations as well. Uh, I should say there are 8-bit um, floating point representations. They're actually quite widely used in telecommunications. They're called MU-law and A-law. I'm not going to look at those for the deep learning applications. So why do I care about precision? Well, I care because the cost of operations and the cost of moving data around is sensitive to precision. And it's really more sensitive to precision than it is to float versus integer. So just to, um, not to make you go through this entire eye chart, um, but um, the uh, difference between a 16-bit uh, floating point multiply and a 32-bit floating point multiply is um, almost four to one. The, uh, the cost of a multiply goes up quadratically with the length of um, the multiplier. The way to think about this is to, to multiply two 32-bit numbers, I really have to multiply four 16-bit numbers which are the two halves of each number by the other two halves of each number. I have to fill in all four quadrants. And so doubling precision quadruples energy cost for multiplies um, and, and the area. Um, the, um, the cost of doing a 32-bit fixed point mult and a 32-bit floating point mult isn't that different. The floating point multiply is a little bit more expensive because I've got to do some um, normalizations and an exponent computation, but I'm actually doing a slightly smaller multiply. I'm doing a 24-bit multiply on the mantissa rather than the 32-bit multiply. Um, for the fixed point. 
The cost of ad is very different between fixed and float, but the ads are all relatively cheap, so it really doesn't matter. What really dominates the cost energetically for the arithmetic um, are the multiplies. Um, and the areas here are um, slightly larger, and that's actually almost about 2x for float versus fixed. Um, but again, that's not usually what's limiting me. The area, as we'll see, is, is actually not dominated uh, by these arithmetic units. Um, it's also really important when you're looking at um, the advantages of reducing precision um, to reduce precision to be able to get a larger effective working set in a certain size memory. Because there's a huge advantage to capturing a working set at, at some level. So if I can capture my working set in an SRAM that's right next to my arithmetic units, that's huge because fetching a 32-bit word out of local SRAM is only five picojoules. Um, and it goes up in order of magnitude at each level of the memory hierarchy. So fetching um, it from on-chip SRAM, but eight millimeters away on-chip, um, um, costs 50 picojoules per word, in order, exactly in order of magnitude higher. Um, and by the way, just to remind you, doing the multiply you're going to do when you fetch this is only um, 3.7 picojoules. So just fetching it from a local SRAM is more expensive than the multiply. Um, it, the, uh, um, the, the cost of, of data movement um, is, uh, is huge compared to the cost of arithmetic. In fact, for almost every computation, the cost of data movement trumps the cost of arithmetic. Arithmetic is almost in the noise. Um, and if I have to go off chip to get, to get this, even with an LPDDR DRAM, um, which is the um, energetically um, cheap one, it's uh, 640 picojoules, so more than two, two orders of magnitude higher, about a factor of 200x over the cost of doing the multiply. Um, and that's doing a 32-bit um, multiply, by the way. Um, the 16-bit the multiply is, um, is, is way cheaper, only about one picojoule. So the cost of fetching and moving data is, is huge. So with, with that as a preamble, you know, what the arithmetic costs, what it costs to move the data around, um, um, let's look at what precision um, we want to represent things with. Oh, and on the cost of moving the data around, one good way to think about this um, is that arithmetic units, let me go back to this chart, much like children and pets, are relatively easy to get. Um, you know, it doesn't take either much diary or much energy uh, for the arithmetic itself. Um, but they're very expensive to take care of. Um, and that's really what this points out. You have to feed them with input data and, and do something with their output data and feed them with instructions. And the cost of taking care of your arithmetic units is far more expensive than the cost of the arithmetic units themselves. So let's talk about precision. Um, here is sort of the core operation that we want to do in a deep neural network. I want to take a weight, weight IJ, um, multiply it by input activation J, um, produce an intermediate product, accumulate that intermediate product, and store it as an output activation B. Um, and what I'm eventually going to converge on, um, but it's going to take me a while to get there, is that we can actually store our weights as four-bit quantities using something called train quantization that I'm not going to get to until I get to the compression part of this talk, um, and decode them to 16 bits. What this means is that the expensive fetch of that weight only cost me four bits, a factor of eight savings over a 32-bit weight. Um, but I'm going to expand it up to 16 bits to actually do the computation. Um, I'm going to store the activations in 16-bit form, um, do the 16 by 16-bit multiply, rounding the result to 16 bits, um, and then accumulate this sum to 24 or 32 bits before truncating it down to 16 bits um, for storage. And that way I won't lose any intermediate precision on the results. And I will point out that there's a technique called batch normalization, where as I compute a weight, um, I want to basically normalize that weight by adding an offset and multiplying, or excuse me, normalize that activation by adding an offset and multiplying by a scale factor so I can sort of center um, that the range of that weight will be computed over a, a mini batch into the dynamic range of my representation. If I do batch normalization, um, I, I make much better use of the range of representation I have, whatever number system I, I use. If I'm doing training, in addition to doing the first part of that network, um, I basically take you know, the uh, input activation, the gradient, which I'm propagating back through my network, I, I multiply those. Um, and now I have the partial derivative that I want to accumulate for this weight. Um, and I'm going to accumulate those, and I can multiply by a learning rate at some point in time. 
Um, but, but I want to accumulate those into here. And the problem is as I um, get further on with my training, this learning rate becomes very small. Um, it might wind up getting to be 10 to the minus 5 or even 10 to the minus 7th in some cases. And so it's getting down to the bottom end of what can be represented in some of these um, number ranges. Recall that both 16-bit floating point and 32-bit fixed point only have about a 10 to the 9th um, dynamic range. And so if I um, have a really small learning rate and the result of this computation winds up being small to begin with, um, this, if I use round to nearest in this computation, I will round my delta w to 0 and I will stop learning. I think this may explain what's happened to a lot of students that I've had in classes. Um, so that you're actually, if you, um, if you carried this computation out with unlimited precision, you would get a weight update. But because I am rounding to limited precision and my update winds up being very small compared to the weight at late stages in training, it just doesn't happen. The delta w goes away. So the solution to this problem is something called stochastic rounding. In stochastic rounding, rather than round to nearest, I basically produce a result here to higher precision. And I basically round it up or down with the probability equal to its uh, level in the range. So for example, if it's 10% of the way between um, number A and number A plus 1, I will round it to A with probability 0.9 and to B with probability 0.1. And so this actually is unbiased. It gives me the correct estimation, the correct expected value of, of the output. Um, if I did round to nearest, I would always round it to the lower weight. Um, and so if I do stochastic rounding rather than round to nearest, I, I get much better results. And I'll show you some, some uh, data on that shortly. So for, in, for inference, um, how low can I cut the weight? So this is without doing the, the compression. Um, this shows multiply energy um, on the uh, left side um, for 32-bit and 16-bit. Um, and I should have probably shown the 16-bit the, the float uh, for comparison, but it's about the same as the 16-bit integer. Remember that the energy doesn't vary very much float versus integer. Um, um, it, it varies a lot, 32-bit to 16-bit. What you see is that our inference accuracy doesn't drop at all uh, going to 16-bit. It drops significantly going to 8. Um, so until I want to do some, some compression, 16 bits is kind of a, a, a sweet place to be um, for precision. Um, this shows results um, with and without stochastic rounding. Um, this is from a, uh, uh, a paper on deep learning with limited numerical precision, which I refer you to if you're interested in um, getting more data than this. was at ICML this year. Uh, the black line here is using 32-bit floating points. So it's considered sort of the, the the gold standard, the best that you can do. Um, and then um, the uh, blue and um, uh, red lines are using fixed point 12-bit and 14-bit respectively. Um, and the um, blue and red are with stochastic rounding. The um, tan and gray are without stochastic rounding. And what you see is that the, the training does not converge. It actually starts di diverging um, after a while. Um, if you don't use a stochastic rounding with the lower precision. But with um, stochastic rounding, um, the 14-bit um, number is nearly as good. 14-bit fixed point number is nearly good, as, as good as a float. Um, and actually, if you use 16-bit um, floating point representations, things are just really good because you have the dynamic range of a 32-bit fixed point um, number. So to, to sum up reduced precision, um, you can save all sorts of important things, memory capacity, bandwidth, power, um, and run faster by using smaller numbers. You know, 32-bit floating point, it works great, but it's more expensive than what you need. Um, floating point 16 is just a really good choice in a lot of ways because it just works. It has the dynamic range of a 32-bit fixed point number, um, but you get a two times gain in memory and a four times gain in multiply power. Um, if you're really careful, you can actually get things down to 8-bit weights for convolutions and 4-bit weights for fully connected layers, and I'll talk about that in the next section. Um, if you do go to limited precision, um, two things are important. One is to make sure you center your activations in the dynamic range. And you do that by using batch normalization, where you basically uh, learn over a mini batch a scale factor and an offset. So you basically land uh, right in the middle of that range rather than being skewed to the upper or lower end of it and not using all of your precision. And the other is to do stochastic rounding, particularly during training, where you get these really tiny weight updates. They will vanish with round to nearest. 
where a stochastic rounding will give you an unbiased expectation um, of those weights, and you'll continue learning um, even after the, um, the weight got to a point where it would have vanished had you not been using the stochastic rounding. Um, so next up is compression. Um, and very often, the cost of computing a network, whether it's for inference or training, is proportional to the size of the network. Particularly for unbatched inference, I at least have to read the whole model in, right? And so if I have a really big model, it's going to take a long time to read it in. Um, when, we, when we put up on archive one of our papers on compression, I got an email from Andrew Ng. It's like three days later thanking me for it, um, for an application I didn't appreciate, which is uh, for people who make mobile applications, that they embed uh, deep networks in, um, they have to be put in the, in the App Store, the Play Store, and there's a limit on download um, to, to a certain number of, of megabytes. And um, if you can compress a network, you can basically put a much more robust bus network and still stay within the download um, sizes um, for, for these networks. Um, so let's talk about how to reduce the size of, of our networks. Um, so the first step is to prune the network. Uh, much like you would prune a tree, you go into your network, and you say this network has too many branches, and you take your loppers and you lop a bunch of them out. Um, this, as, I'll, as I'll talk about um, in a little while, this is actually a very old idea. The first paper I could find on it was by, of course, uh, Ian LeCun with a, a paper called Optimal Brain Damage, which talked about the optimal way to, to prune your network. Um, but actually, while it was a very active uh, field of research in, in the late 80s and early 90s, it seemed to have petered out, and, and we kind of uh, um, rediscovered it, and it works really well. So if I take, um, why did that not advance? Okay, if I take a network and prune it, um, um, you first think that I've destroyed my network. So in fact, if I prune it without retraining, depending on whether I use an L2 norm or an L1 norm, um, you know, if I try to prune 90% of my network out, I've just destroyed the accuracy. I'm down you know, almost 5% in accuracy at like 80% with an L2 norm. But the secret is to prune your network. And by pruning the network, what you do is you train the network normally, and then you apply a threshold operation. And every weight that's below a certain threshold, you simply remove from the network, and you make it so that it doesn't grow back. It does not, under subsequent training, try to increment itself. Um, and then once that, that, that is pruned and you've destroyed your accuracy, you then run the training set by the network again. Uh, with the constraint that you cannot um, add to the, to the pruned uh, things, and you get most of your accuracy back. And in fact, it does substantially better with an L2 norm than an L1 norm. Um, and in fact, during parts of this, it actually has accuracy better than the original network. Um, and, um, and then if you iteratively f uh, follow this procedure, so you basically um, prune, retrain, and then reapply the threshold, reprune and retrain, you can wind up actually um, doing substantially better, essentially taking across a really wide range of networks. These are results for AlexNet, um, but across a wide range of network, including um, RNNs for, for natural language processing, we, we tend to be able to get 90% of the weights out of, out of fully connected layers without any loss of accuracy. So these are results for, for AlexNet. Um, what you see is that um, while all the arithmetic operations are in the COM layers, all the weights are in the fully connected layers. And we basically get rid of 90% of those. So it winds up being 90% of the total um, networks. This shows by layer, where by each layer 100%, how much we prune. What you notice is we can't take very much out of the first layer, because you pretty much have to look at all the pixels of the input image. But once you start getting into the deeper feature detectors, you can prune th um, uh, 2 thirds of them. You can get rid of 2 thirds of the uh, weights in most of the convolutional layers, and about 90% of the weights in um, most of the fully connected layers. Um, on VGGNet, very similar results. The convolutional layers get about two-thirds pruning. Um, the fully connected layers, especially the really expensive ones, are actually able to get almost 95% out, 93% total pruning on, on the whole network. Um, these are some results. I'll sort of go through quickly on, on pruning neural talk uh, with a long short-term memory, so it applies to, uh, to recurrent networks as well. What you see is you can prune up to easily 80 90% with no loss of accuracy at 95%. Um, with, with the retraining, which is a green line, you start to get some loss of accuracy. And it's kind of funny um, to see, I should, by, by the way, acknowledge uh, Song Han, who's my student sitting in the front row here. These are all his results. Um, it's kind of funny to see you know, w what the loss of accuracy is. So pruning at 95%, um, instead of saying a soccer player in red is running in the field, it says a man in a red shirt and black and white black shirt is running through a field. 
So it's, it's not completely brain dead, but it's just not um, as good or the same answer that it got before you removed 20% or I should say all but 5% of its neurons. Uh, I don't think any of us would work as well if 95% of our neurons were removed. Um, what's neat about these compression techniques is if you're in a um, situation where you can't batch, they substantially improve performance by simply uh, minimizing the amount of data that you have to fetch. So these are results um, basically running a, uh, a pruned network on um, both CPUs and GPUs. So um, you know, the one X here is a CPU running the dense network before pruning. Um, we wind up getting, you know, order of, if you look at the geometric mean bar here, order of 3X performance improvement on the CPU. The GPU before doing anything was actually 15 times faster than the CPU on this benchmark. And it gets about 3X as well. And then this is the mobile platform, which gets actually more like 4X um, on this. Um, so again, the, the history of pruning, um, dating back to some work that Ian Lacan did in, in 1990 and, and lots of papers um, through the 90s. We by no, by no means invented this. We kind of uh, pulled this uh, dusty one off the shelves and, and dusted it off to apply it to modern networks. And if you want to learn more about this, I will um, encourage you to, to see Song's poster um, tomorrow morning um, in uh, what, C number 12. Um, so now that we've pruned our network, let's talk about um, how to get rid of the weight um, storage. So the pruning you can think of as being uh, this little flow chart here, train the connectivity, train the network normally, um, apply your threshold, lop out the weights that are below a threshold, retrain the weights to learn your accuracy back, and then rinse and repeat. Um, this basically gives us the same accuracy and reduces our size by tenfold. We get an order of magnitude size reduction by pruning. Um, we now want to do less precision. So what we're going to do is, um, rather than linearly quantize the weights, when most people go to reduce precision, they basically will say take a 32-bit weight and replace it with a 16-bit or an 8-bit weight. That implies a linear quantization where each bit represents a weight. You know, the ith bit has weight 2 to the ith in an integer representation. We're going to do it differently. We're going to use the um, k bits of your weight to, to look up 2 to the k code words. And we're going to generate those code words by doing a k-means clustering of the weights. That generates a code book. And then we're going to basically run the training set by and do backpropagation compute the partial derivative of the loss function with respect to the code word and update the code word to train our weights. It's a technique we call train quantization. Um, we retrain the code book and we wind up having the same accuracy and we get not quite another 4x uh, out in size. So we're down by, say, 35x um, in size. To give you an idea how that works, um, we're basically sharing weights. We start out and we train the network. All the weights are independent. We do a k-means clustering and that basically um, clusters the weights into the blue, the pink, the tan, and the green weights. We force all of those weights now to have the same value, um, and we retrain the network to fine tune the, the centroids on those weights. So with um, train quantization, um, you wind up with a distribution of weights that's shown with the red dots here. So if I have four bits, I get 16 weights. And you'll see that I've put the red dots where they do the most good. If I simply used a four-bit integer representation, I would be sampling this space uniformly, which is the green X's, which doesn't um, capture the, um, the uh, distribution as well. By the way, this is what a weight distribution looks like after pruning. Um, the middle part here has been removed. That's what the pruning did. And it winds up not being a, a normal looking curve, but actually a bimodal um, distribution. If you apply this very aggressively with no loss of accuracy, you can represent the fully connected layers with four bits. This basically is. Um, bits going down. And actually, the accuracy doesn't really fall off a cliff until you go from 2 to 1. You get remarkably good accuracy with just 2 bits per weight in the fully connected layers. Um, the uh, uh, convolutional layers start losing accuracy at 8 bits um, and fall off a cliff later. Um, and so there's a workshop poster on Thursday um, on this. And I'll encourage you guys to go see. Again, Song is the lead author um, on this. Um, so I'm going to skip over some of these in the interest of uh, um, of time, we got how I'm doing here. Um, actually, I think I'm doing okay. Um, let me go back to that. So, so we, we've applied this to a bunch of networks. These tiny linet um, is just a nice way of checking things very quickly. Essentially, 40x compression rate on both the fully connected and the convolutional versions of linet. Um, AlexNet 35x, um, uh, VGD um, roughly 50x, and, and, and similar results um, for the uh, neural talk, which is not, not on this slide. Um, and basically, this is compressing things by pruning the unimportant connections, then quantizing um, the weight sharing. And then another step that I haven't talked about is 
after you've quantized exploiting the non-uniform distribution of the weights um, with Huffman coding. So what does 30 to 50x compression of a network mean? Um, well, it means that you can put these things in mobile applications. I can take a really complex um, neural network for speech recognition or language translation, and I can download it to your phone because instead of taking you know, three gigabytes, it's now 100 megabytes. Um, and that's sort of the, the download limit. Um, um, it reduces my memory bandwidth if I'm doing um, real-time applications where I'm batching, there's no reuse, and I've got um, fully connected layers. I just reduce the memory bandwidth, which is what is a real limiter in these networks by 30 to 50x. Um, and a real multiplier that I'll talk about um, even more when we talk about um, fixed function hardware is I've reduced the, um, the size of the working set uh, by 30 to 50x, which means for a lot of working sets, it will now fit in on-chip memory instead of having to be in DRAM. And so, so remember that order of magnitude cost differential um, from going from local memory to distant on-chip memory to off-chip memory, if I can pull in through one of those levels, there's another order of magnitude of efficiency to be had. So before talking about fixed function hardware as a, as a hardware designer, which is sort of near and dear to me, um, let me talk about better algorithms. This will be sort of a, a short section, but it's an important one because I've seen a lot of people accelerate the fixed function hardware, um, but do it with the slow algorithms. And they actually wind up being slower than running on general purpose hardware um, using the fast algorithms. So, so um, my mantra here is if you're going to accelerate something, make sure you start with the fast algorithm because a better algorithm will trump better hardware all the time. I hate to say that as a hardware guy. Um, and so um, for convolutional neural networks, we spend the bulk of our multiplies in the convolutional layers. In fact, it seems to be all the rage these days to sometimes just get rid of the fully connected layers and do everything with convolutional layers as, as with GoogleNet and, and the inception um, architecture. So um, if you're going to be doing convolutions, the right way to do a convolution is with a transform. Remember, the, the complexity of doing a convolution, if I do it brute force, is k squared, where k is the size of my kernel. If I have a k squared kernel, I need to, to basically multiply every element of that kernel um, by every element of the window to produce one pixel of output. So for every pixel of output, I do k squared multiplies. Um, if, if, on the other hand, I apply the basic theorem that we all learned when we were sophomores in college, that um, the um, if I do an FFT and a pointwise multiply and an inverse FFT, that's a convolution. Um, I can basically reduce it from, from a um, n squared computation to an n log n. But the n here now is the size of the whole image. You think that that's a really bad idea. You can tile the image and play with that. But the thing that really makes this work is the fact that I'm not doing it once, right? Um, let's, let's look at the inputs, because they're the ones I'll be doing over and over again. For these, each of these inputs, I have to compute not one output channel, but say 256 output channels. So if I pay the n log n computation to apply an FFT to each input image, I get to reuse that transformed input image 256 times, once for each output image. And similarly, I now have to do the inverse transform for the output images, um, but I get to do that um, for each of, of the input images. And so I get to sort of amortize the cost of the transform over the fact that I'm doing this convolution for every input image times every output image. Um, so the way to think about this is that if I have um, k input filters and j output filters, I basically get to do the transformation once and then reuse um, them k times for the input and j times for the output. Um, so, so I'm amortizing those FFTs over k input maps and j output maps. So a conventional convolution um, I basically do k times j, that's all pairs, input to output maps, times m squared, where m is the size of the convolutional kernel, I'm assuming it's square, um, times n squared, once for each pixel of the output map. Um, for the FFT, um, I do the 4kj n squared, that's basically doing the pointwise multiply. Uh, the 4, really, I can reduce to 3, is the cost of doing the complex pointwise multiplication. Then I have this thing which is n log n, but it's multiplied by k plus j instead of k times j. So if I have hundreds of filters, this, is, this term goes away, and I basically have reduced um, a, a, an m squared computation to a computation with, with one complex multiply per point. Um, so the uh, uh, paper here by uh, uh, Matthew et al. Um, in uh, 2013 is sort of has the data on this, and this is their result out of the out of the paper. 
um, showing speed ups even with three by three kernels. With a three by three kernel, this is about twice as fast as doing the brute force convolution. And it gets better from there. And in fact, what you see is the cost of doing a convolution with FFT is independent of your kernel size. I can do a 13 by 13 kernel with exactly the same cost of compute as a 3 by 3 kernel. And so what I suspect is as people move to doing FFT-based convolutional kernels, they will go back to using larger, um, um, larger convolutions, um, whereas it, there seems to be a trend to push everything down by, to 3 by 3s and 5 by 5s today. Um, the other um, fast algorithm I wanted to mention, and I won't spend uh, too much time on it, um, is uh, Winograd's uh, convolution. And this goes back to a, uh, a paper in, in uh, Siam in 1980, uh, and more recently uh, in this uh, uh, paper by, uh, uh, the thing is covering the author's names, in its recent paper um, on fast algorithms for conv convolutional neural networks. And it's basically the same thing as the FFT, but a different um, transformation that's actually based on thinking of the convolution as polynomial multiplication, and then applying the Chinese re remainder theorem to the polynomials. Whenever I try to work the math out, it makes my head hurt. But you don't actually have to work the math out. You just find a library um, that does it. And so basically what you're doing is the same thing. The, uh, the u and v here are the kernel in the input image um, transformed by the forward um, uh, Winograd transformations. And then the a, the application of multiplying by a and a transform is the inverse um, uh, transformation. And what it does is, again, it reduces, you, you can um, amortize the, the cost of the A, which is transforming the output image, um, the cost of transforming the input image and, and the kernels uh, over the fact that you have many input channels and many output channels. And it basically reduces, again, this sort of K squared computation uh, to do a convolution to being a single real pointwise multiply as opposed to the convo, uh, complex pointwise multiply um, for the FFT. So, so um, to, to sum up algorithms, and I wanted to do this before getting into the, the hardware part, because you'll, you'll see um, how a lot of the conventional hardware, or I should say special purpose hardware, has dealt with this. Um, if you do an FFT or Winograd convolution rather than a regular convolution, you're basically two times faster if you're doing three by three convolutions. And it just gets better. Um, with FFT, you're about 25 times faster um, on 11 by 11s, um, which are, for example, part of the first stage of AlexNet is an 11 by 11. Um, so um, special purpose hardware running a brute force convolution is slower than a GPU um, running uh, a transform-based convolution. Um, and what's really great about the FFT convolutions is they're in independent of convolution size. It costs no more to do a 5 by 5 or 7 by 7 or even a 11 by 11 um, convolution th than it does to do a 3 by 3 if you're using an FFT to do it. Okay. Um, my second favorite topic after GPUs is hardware for deep neural networks, because I'm fundamentally a hardware designer and I like building widgets. And many people have been building widgets um, for deep neural networks, but I'll, I'll preface this section by saying that um, they hold great potential um, in special circumstances, um, but for 90% of the applications of neural networks, you're better off with a GPU. Um, with that preface, let me, let me dive in and talk about fixed function hardware. Um, to be maximally efficient, you're better off with fixed function hardware unless you're memory limited. If you're doing a, a batch one neural network um, where you have big fully connected layers and you're fetching those parameters from DRAM, I don't care how you do your arithmetic. Your energy and your time is going to be completely limited by your memory system and you'll do no better um, than, than a GPU memory system. They're very highly tuned. In fact, most fixed function hardware won't match that because their memory systems aren't as good. Um, but if you're not memory limited um, and you aren't going to be changing your algorithm anytime, I mean, you know, somebody pr publishes a paper on archive next week and you know, your, your chip hasn't even come back from fab yet, that's too bad, um, um, you're, you're fine. So the people have been doing this for a while. Um, a, uh, a piece of work that got a lot of attention when it came out at ASPLOS um, in 2014, so it's February 2014, was Dian Now, um, which my um, Chinese-speaking graduate students inform me means electric brain. Um, so I want to know where I can get one of those. Um, um, and it basically has a dedicated function unit um, for doing um, the, the multiplies um, and then summing the, the additions for both um, the fully connected and convolutional layers. So it has 16-bit um, you know, um, integer multipliers and 16 of them and then a summing tree to produce the one activation. Um, it has relatively small buffers um, for the weights and the activations. 
and a small output activation buffer. So it requires going out to DRAM um, to fetch everything, but if you're batching, you can get a certain amount of reuse out of this. Um, in, uh, and they you know, basically show, show some results here in, uh, um, I believe it's a 65 nanometer process, um, getting you know, reasonable results in performance per watt. Um, so, you know, 452 giga ops at a half, a half a watt, so it's about 1,000 ops per watt, 16-bit fixed point. Um, th this uh, same group, which is a collaboration between uh, folks at INRIA and, and, uh, and Chinese Academy of Sciences in Tsinghua, um, went on to do da dian now, which means bigger electric brain. Um, and what they did here is realize that they were limited by their memory and chose to put a bunch of memory um, on their component. Uh, so they have embedded DRAM on this part. The part is basically a big memory chip. These are all the memory um, components, and it's tiled. So you have some of the memory and then a, uh, um, a uh, compute unit for each of these tiles, and then the function unit so basically sits in the middle of, of each of them. And it basically can hold 12 million parameters and can consume 16 watts. And so if you have a model that fits in 12 million parameters, this is great, because now all the fetches are entirely on-chip. You avoid, you're, you're basically getting global on-chip references at sort of 50 picojoule per word, not having to do the 640 picojoule per word for going off-chip. And they also published in ISCA this year, uh, Shidian now, which means vision electric brain, which is really sort of um, specialized due to the convolutional um, layers. Uh, earlier um, at uh, ISCA, and I believe it was 2012, um, somehow the date got dropped off of that um, reference, um, there was um, the convolution engine paper published, which basically shows how even if you're doing the brute force algorithm, um, you can basically reduce your, your uh, energy by building a fixed function piece of hardware that kind of maximizes the weight reuse um, and, um, and activation reuse of doing a convolution. But again, this is doing the k-squared convolution rather than a transform-based convolution, so it's doing k-squared too much work. Um, and of course, um, it's always been published first by somebody in Jan LeCun's group. He has a paper on new flow, um, which is an implementation of uh, uh, doing neural networks and other vision algorithms um, where they implemented 150 GOPS um, thing in an IBM SOI process. Um, so um, recently, um, some work by my student Song um, looked at how we could take our compressed network and, and accelerate it because the problem with a lot of these previous networks, probably the best of which is the, uh, the, the DADIAN now, um, are limited by having to fetch all of their parameters from off chip. DADIAN now overcomes this by having on chip EDRAM, but it can only hold 12 million parameters. And you can cascade these chips together, but you know, to hold a 100 million parameter model, you would need eight of them. It gets, gets a little bit unwieldy. Um, we, we, we chose to look at how we could take these compressed networks um, and, um, and, and deal with them. So with compressed networks, even without EDRAM, we're able to take a, a pretty sizable um, network and hold these sparse um, matrix in um, on-chip SRAM. Um, and these sparse um, activations are actually held in pointers that are in this arithmetic section here. Um, these are the destination activation pointers and the source activation pointers. And by storing the matrix in a um, compressed sparse column format rather than compressed sparse row, we're able to exploit the um, dynamic uh, sparsity of the output activations by doing a distributed find first non-zero. So we basically, in a distributed manner, find the non-zeros in the input activation, um, broadcast those to all of these tiles. Every tile multiplies that activation by its portion of the column that's non-zero, um, basically using the sparse matrix representation to skip over the zeros without having to visit them, um, and then updating those. And then you switch the input and output activations for the next layer. Um, the speed ups here um, have been really good. And again, this, uh, the first parts of these I've already showed you about. These are the speed ups of just compressing on the CPU and the GPU. What you see is you can go even faster than the GPU. Um, the geometric mean number here is um, about 180 um, X. Look at my mouse. Uh, you can't see this off the screen up here. There it is. About 180 X. Um, and that's because you're able to keep this entirely, it's really a question of locality. Here we're keeping it not just entirely on chip, but all of the data is being fetched by SRAM sitting right next to the arithmetic unit. So it's done in that five picojoule uh, bin. Um, and that, for that reason, the energy um, efficiency is, is much larger. It's actually 24,000 times um, faster than the CPU, uh, more energy efficient than the CPU. Again, I've lost my mouse. Um, that, there it is, okay. That's the number over here. 24,000 times faster than the CPU. And you, you, you may basically have me in disbelief at this uh, point and think that I've 
cook the books, but you can actually multiply the numbers together and see how I get to this number. I first of all have pruned the network by about 50x. So I save 50x um, by only having to fetch 1 50th the parameters. Then for the fully connected layers, which is where a lot of the density um, comes from, I'm doing a 4-bit representation. So I get another um, reduction in, in energy put by not doing the 32-bit floating point. Um, and then I get this 120x advantage by being able to fetch my parameters from on-chip SRAM at 5 picojoules per bit rather than from off-chip DRAM at 640 picojoules per word. Um, and that winds up giving me, the, the, if you multiply them all together, it actually comes up to higher than, than, than 24,000. And the reason it's only 24,000 is that this is implemented in a 45 nanometer process. It's about six generations back. Um, it scales well. This basically shows as you go um, from you know, one uh, processing element to 256 processing elements, um, how the performance scales. Um, some of the networks um, start, start, start topping out at around 64. Um, most of them scale pretty linearly up to 256. And I should say this is strong scaling. Um, the, uh, uh, even for the big layers here, a lot of the VGG layers, they're 4K by, by layers. But with 256 neurons, um, you have 16 um, activations um, per, um, per PE. But remember, our density here is about 10%. So you actually have 1.6 non-zeros per processing element and you're still getting very good speed up, which just shows that if you can eliminate um, a lot of the overhead, this has been very highly engineered to have very efficient communication and synchronization, you can exploit the parallelism down to single operations. And that's in fact what's going on when you scale this um, to 256. Um, so so um, no talk on special purpose hardware for deep learning would be complete without talking about GPUs. Um, so, so you have to realize that, that this is the CTO of a GPU company telling you about FPGAs. Um, um, and so, so uh, but I'm, I'm trying to be entirely factual here. Um, so the facts are, uh, what, a, what, a G, what an FPGA is, is a field configurable ASIC. All the, all the things I've showed you so far, the Dion Now, the New Flow, um, the Convolution Engine, our Efficient Inference Engine, are all ASICs, that is application-specific integrated circuits. The great thing about an ASIC is you can build hardware to do exactly what you want, get rid of all the control overhead, um, and it's great, except the cost of doing an ASIC these days is around $50 million to get the first copy. In fact, whenever I, I talk to people, they think I'm being optimistic. Um, many people would use $100 million as, as the sort of engineering and tooling cost um, to, to build NASIC uh, today. I actually have done several startups in the past where the, our business plan was, was to build um, special purpose ASICs. And nobody does those anymore because the cost is, is just too high. You, do, you just don't see, um, see them anymore. Instead, if somebody has a piece of hardware they want to prototype, They'll build it on a field programmable gate array, an FPGA. And the, there's good news and bad news about FPGAs. The good news is that they have a bunch of fixed function logic on them. In the early days, in the old 4000 series Xilinx parts that came out in the 1980s, I was a professor at MIT at the time, and I converted our um, undergraduate logic design course to use FPGAs. And um, all you got on the FPGAs were what were called LUTs, lookup tables. So you could implement random logic using for, for input ar arbitrary function gates. Um, and today, in addition to those, you have fixed function integer units, floating point units, and memories, and, the fixed and, and even ARM cores on some of them. And those fixed function units are great. They're as good as what you get on any other chip. The problem is whenever you need logic that's not on those fixed function units, um, if you build logic using the LUTs, and it's not hard to understand why this is the case, if I build, say, a for input AND gate on a real ASIC, um, it's going to be about eight tracks in one direction by ten tracks in the other direction. And a track um, these days winds up being about a tenth of a micron. So a, um, a four input gate in an ASIC is about a, a micron by a micron um, in size. If you look at the way that the LUTs are implemented in an FPGA, it winds up being like a hundred microns by a hundred microns. So in area you're off by about ten to the fourth. And it winds up being that in sort of energy and speed, you wind up being about um, you know, one and a half to two orders of magnitude off. We've actually done some prototyping studies and I wound up sort of with the um, FPGA typically being about 100x worse than the ASIC for anything that doesn't actually fit um, in, into the fixed function units. Um, and so um, this usually winds up being sort of the demise of ASICs, particularly if you want to do some things like reduced precision. The, the, the recent, um, you know, um, um, area and stratics parts from um, 
um, um, Altera. Now, Intel, for example, have 32-bit floating point units, but they don't have 16-bit floating point units. If you wanted to reduce precision and do 16-bit floating point, you'd be down a factor of 100. You're better off doing the 32-bit floating point. Um, even some of the most um, um, you know, ardent um, proponents of this, which is the people from Doug Berger's cat, um, catapult group at um, um, Microsoft, um, have um, data that basically shows that they're not really that competitive. They're better than CPUs, although this number is kind of low for CPU. My number would be higher. Um, this is basically um, GOPS per um, uh, joule on the CPU, on the FPGA, and on a Titan X. Um, and also, I don't know why they're charging a Titan X with 475 watts. It's a 250 watt GPU, and that counts the voltage regulator and the RAMs. Um, but even so, it's you know, you know, on the order of a factor of eight more efficient. This is from a presentation um, that Microsoft did at, at Hot Chips this summer. And this was presenting their real results. The next two slides are hand wavy slides showing that in theory they should be doing much better, but they aren't. This is what they're doing. Um, and um, short on time, so I'm actually going to sort of quickly skip over this. But this is sort of similar results from a bunch of different um, FPGA projects on um, you know, various Xilinx um, FPGAs. And what you see is that the GOPS per watt numbers come out in about that range. Um, this one actually winds up doing a little bit better, and, and there's, there's some reasons for that. So let me sort of wrap up the hardware comparison with, with the table and then, then some bullet points. Um, so in the table, I'll compare a Titan X, a Tegra K1. Um, these are some of Song's results, and I haven't been able to get him an X1 yet for some reason. Um, the an, an FPGA, which is um, uh, AI, which um, was one of the ones in the previous slide. The, uh, the Dadian now, that's the bigger electric brain, the one with the on-chip EDRAM, and then our efficient inference engine. And um, if you look at um, how it does on the whole operation, the real winner here is, is Dadian now, because uh, for the convolutional uh, stages, it, it can sustain very high um, GOPS per second. But if you wind up having to implement some fully connected layers um, with a batch size of one that don't fit on chip, you quickly wind up down with this efficiency for um, matrix times vector. Um, and we wind up doing a lot better with the efficient inference engine. Even so, that um, winds up in, in GOPS per watt uh, doing quite a bit better than you'll do um, on, the, uh, um, on the GPUs. So there is advantage to fixed function um, as long as you're not limited by memory. So um, just to sum up, um, we looked at a bunch of uh, fixed function units, um, the, uh, the, the various electric brains, the convolution engine, and our efficient inference engine, which is really entined, designed to directly execute um, pruned and compressed neural networks. Um, and it does that in a way that does no data movements. You're fetching everything from local. Um, the, the, the bottom line is that um, the arithmetic performance per watt of special purpose hardware winds up really being about 2x a GPU. Um, so if I look at the numbers of what we get on a, on a, a Tegra X1 running FP16, um, basically half of our energy is in the FP16 units. Um, and therefore, if you eliminated all the overhead and you were doing FP16, you could get 2x out of fixed function hardware. Um, if you're memory limited, you're no better than a GPU, because your memory, if you have to fetch from off-chip memory, you're, you're basically limited by that off-chip memory, um, and you'll, you'll do no better. The big win from special purpose hardware um, is, is when it's a special purpose memory system. This is the case both for the Dadian now and for our efficient inference engine, because if you can get the entire model to fit non-chip memory, um, then you do do substantially better, um, because you're, you're um, basically eliminating that expensive memory fetch. Um, from off-chip memory. Um, and decompressing highly compressed networks requires a lot of irregular operations of representing the weights by four bits. There's bit manipulation to extract the four bits you want, a table lookup to look up the code word and decompress the code word. That stuff runs really well on special purpose hardware and not so well on CPUs and GPUs. So there's a big win um, for the special purpose memory system for the decompression, not so much for straight arithmetic. GPUs are within about a factor of two on FP16. Um, for the straight arithmetic. Um, FPGAs are just inefficient ASICs. They're great at arithmetic and memory. Um, they're really bad when you've got to build things out of the LUTs, which also includes things like decompressing the networks and doing other than the standard arithmetic operations um, that come built in. Um, so we're getting toward the end. I see everybody looking at me as if I'm the only thing standing between them and dinner. Um, so let me get to the, uh, to the summary part, and then perhaps we'll have time for a few questions at the end. 
So to, to go back to where we started, um, the, the current revolution in deep learning is very exciting and it's being enabled by two things. One is lots of data and the other is really fast hardware. It takes both to, to uh, make neural networks work. The, a lot of the basic technologies were around in the 1980s. Um, we didn't have either the data or, or the um, fast GPUs until today. Um, in 1990, um, a CPU, you know, so when you know, Jan Le wrote the original uh, convolutional neural network paper in 1989, um, a single CPU had a spec int score, a measure of performance of 100. Um, today, that CPU has um, a spec int score of 30,000, and you can get six to eight or even 16 of them on one chip. So that gives you 200,000 times more performance on one CPU chip than you got you know, with an Intel 486 in um, 1989. Um, there are very few other endeavors um, of, of human beings that have had a 200,000 times increase over any period of time, you know, let alone 15 years. Um, but you know, the, it was a really good ride while it lasted, but it's over. I mean, the, the Moore's Law charts are flattening out. We're not going to get that increase of performance um, from, from process scaling anymore. Um, the way we're going to get it now is, is sort of through cleverness of various kinds. The first kind of cleverness is to move to a GPU, which will give you about another 5 to 10x. So instead of 200,000 times our machine from 1990, we're going to be 2 million times. Um, and again, the reason why GPUs do so much better is that they're just very efficient parallel execution engines. We hide the unpredictable latency of, of cache misses, not by having complicated uh, out-of-order scheduling hardware as a CPU does, but rather by, by multi-threading and just switching threads, which is very inexpensive. Um, and you know, we can basically be you know, comparing the TX1, which is only one generation of technology back to a Core i7. Um, you know, one generation of technology back, it's 11.5 times as efficient. Um, um, you can then get another factor of 100 by exploiting parallelism on the GPUs, as, as Baidu demonstrated with their Deep Speech 2, um, scaling from you know, 1 to 128 GPUs with, with linear speed up. Um, if you really want to go faster than that, um, you can then get about another factor of 100 going to special purpose hardware. But it doesn't come from hardwiring the arithmetic computation. It comes from getting the working set of memory on chip because that's what gets me that 120x difference of 640 picojoules fetching a weight from DRAM to 5 picojoules fetching it from a local memory. And it comes by um, hardwiring the decompression of the compressed network, which is a very irregular computation and isn't as well matched um, for CPUs and GPUs. So this is the point in time where um, the, the good Dr. Daly um, is going to do a prescription. So basically the, the starting prescription is accelerate the best algorithms prune the network, compress the network, um, and FFT, the, the convolutions, use a fast algorithm for the convolutions. Um, and then you're up sort of you know, 25 billion over what could be done in 1990. So here's the prescription. Um, what should you do um, to you know, have high performance hardware for your favorite neural network? So if you're um, training, use a cluster of eight to 16 GPUs. There's, there's um, you know, nothing that um, you know, even begins to compare to that now. I think that if I were to build special purpose hardware for training, I could probably do a little bit better. But by the time I got done, there would be a new generation of GPU that would probably be better than my hardware. Um, it's the best performance, um, the best performance per watt, the best performance per dollar. And, and because you know, the, the modern GPUs have um, you know, 300 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth, um, for the cases where um, your memory bandwidth limited, that they're just unparalleled. Actually, once we move to stacked memories, we'll have a terabyte per second of memory bandwidth um, on, on our GPUs. And the parallelism is easy. Um, and I should say the programming is easy, too, because all of the standard packages, CAFE, Torch, Theano, all have, have GPU-enabled packages in them. Um, if you're in the data center doing inference, um, use a Titan X or, or the, the, the Tesla is our data center um, brand. They're sort of made more reliable, more suitable for data centers. The M40 is basically a Titan X in a more reliable um, configuration. The M4 is for an observation that many people in a data center don't have a PCIe slot provisioned with 250 watts, which is what a, a Titan X needs. So the M4 is a 75 watt GPU set up for the data center um, and can be operated anywhere from a 25 to 75 watt power envelope 
um, for power limited um, data center applications. And so a lot of people have already deployed a data center, they've got 50 watts in a PCIe slot, they can now get you know, way better performance putting a 50 watt M4 um, into that slot. Um, if you're building a self-driving car or you want your toaster to be smarter, I can't quite understand how my toaster can be smarter than it already is. Um, but, but if you basically want to put inference in mobile devices, what you really want is a Tegra SOC. Um, it's 11.5 times the perf quad of a CPU. It's kind of the right form factor for Internet of Things and, and for automotive. Um, and if you want the absolute best performance um, and efficiency, use an ASIC. But your model better fit in the on-chip memory, or you're basically going to be no better than a GPU because you're going to be memory limited, and your power uh, and performance is going to be completely limited by that memory interface, and that's going to be the same as the GPU. Um, and use the best algorithm and make sure it's not going to change because if somebody publishes a great paper on archive next week um, and your special purpose hardware can't do that, you're going to be really bummed. So um, with that, um, let me thank you and I probably have seven minutes of time for questions. Okay. Uh, by, by the way, before questions, I should ask like Song to stand up. Song did all the heavy lifting and everything I talked about, and I just got up here and talked about it. So. <laughs> He'll be graduating in about a year, but I'm going to try to hire him at NVIDIA. Romain? Thank you, Professor, for your intuition. I had one question. Um, I was wondering if maybe you could elaborate on your intuition behind why exploring a larger convolution size will um, happen after you know we start using FFTs to do all of our convolutions. Um, is there any specific reason for that? Oh, that, that's a really good question. So the can. question, um, I guess everybody can hear since you have a mic. The question is, why do I think people will move to larger convolution size once um, we're using FFTs for convolution? And, and the reason is it's free. Um, and so having a larger convolution can't hurt um, because if, if, if the right network was to do a 3x3, three three, you would train the 10x10, 10 10, or actually you probably want an outside, the 9x9 nine nine convolution, and it would be all zeros except for the 3x3 three three in the middle, right? But if there's some value to having those weights further out have non-zero values, then it doesn't cost you anything. It's free. You might as well use them. So if it's free and it does more, I imagine people will do that. Um, th there's a trade-off between the size of the convolution and the number of convolutional layers. And you need a certain number of, of convolutional layers, a certain amount of depth to get enough nonlinearity in your function. You can't do it all with one convolutional layer because that will only learn linear things. You need to have convolutional layer, nonlinearity convolutional layer to be able to, to get nonlinear feature detectors. And so you need some number of layers. But once you have that number of layers, you can get a much bigger receptive field by making the individual convolutions in those layers larger, and it doesn't cost you anything if you're doing an FFT convolution. Do you mind if I go with the follow-up? Really sure. quick, sorry. Oh, I was, was going to say, is, 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 is that framework at all amenable to variable size convolutions in the same kind of architecture? Um, yeah, certainly, because once, um, once you're doing the transform thing, what you typically will do is you'll tile the image, and then you'll transform both the kernel and the input map to the tile size, so you can do the point-wise multiply at the tile size. And so you could, you could um, make the, the convolutions between layers variable size or even within a layer um, if you basically switch parameter sets at, at, on different fields of, of the layer, you could use different size convolutions. I have a, a question about uh, pruning. Okay. So um, when you have a uh, before pruning, the uh, connections are implicit. You don't need to have a list of uh, all connections yep. because you have convolutions. But uh, once you prune, uh, does that mean that now you need to also store somewhere in your memory the list, the explicit list of... Um, yeah, that's it's a great question. So um, the pruning results I gave all include the overhead of um, representation for the sparse matrix. So when you have a dense matrix, all you have to do is remember the, the weights because it's implicit where they are. If you have a sparse matrix, you typically um, store it in a certain format. And the format we use is the um, compressed sparse row format. Um, let me find the, uh, it's actually easiest to show you the hardware picture. Um, ah, overshot. Um, 
Well, that's interesting. You get my family picture up there. Beautiful family. Um, so um, the, in the compressed sparse row, excuse me, we use a compressed sparse column format. We, um, we store um, a pointer. So we have a big, we have a big array of non-zeros. And then we have a big array of how many zeros are between the non-zeros. And we have a pointer to that pair of arrays. They're one to one, so we only need one pointer for every um, column. So that basically says where in the array that column starts. And then we basically have, in addition to the weights, the, the spacing to the next weight. And so the overhead, um, if you're using 32-bit values, is um, basically about 4 bits for 32-bit values, like you know 12% or something. Once we condense down to 4 bits per weight with the uh, quantized training, the overhead is 100%. But all of the compression results that I gave you include the overhead for the sparse matrix representation. But does that mean, does that mean you, you can't do your FFT because now your, your uh, receptive field has holes in it? Um, yeah, so that's a really good question. So if you're, doing, if you're going to do an FFT, you have to first expand it out um, because the FFT algorithm um, requires you know, dense elements, a dense algorithm. Okay, thanks. And actually, at a certain level of sparsity, you'd be better off just doing the DFT. Thank you for the talk, Professor. Uh, a question on using the FFT in the kind of the energy hierarchy, moving data around is bad, computing is good, yeah. you know, as you illustrated on your slides. To get the benefit or the power with FFT, we really need to have a fair amount of input and output feature maps. That way you're minimizing the overhead from the transformations uh, to the spatial and back. That, that, that's right, yeah. You're, you're amortizing the transform over the number of maps. Yeah. Exactly. So, but the total number of feature maps you have is the product of input and output feature maps and the size of the FFT maps that you're using is actually larger. So you end up having to have a lot of feature maps that end up being larger in size than the original kernels that you had if you were just doing the brute force convolution. Yeah, that's How does really that good. balance or shake out in the Yeah, so that's a really good question. And that, that's the reason why, even though sort of the way this is illustrated, it sort of shows um, the kernels and the input feature maps being expanded up to image size. You typically don't do this at image size. You typically tile your FFTs. And so you'll take your image and you'll tile it typically only slightly larger than the FFT kernel. Um, and then you'll take the tiles with overlap to account for the FFT kernel, and you'll take those tiles of input image and those tiles of kernel, um, and you'll transform them. And because the, the dilation is relatively small, it does increase your storage um, slightly compared to just storing the kernels and the input maps. But depending on how you choose the tile size, it's perhaps maybe 2 or 3x. It's not an enormous. Yeah, I was just thinking for like a tile size of 16 by 16, which for small feature map sizes and 3 by 3 kernels is reasonable. You're yeah, kind you, of going you may, from, you may not want to go that big. Well, okay. Yeah, I was thinking from that you were going from 9 to 256, but I guess if you're going yeah. smaller. Yeah. Thank you for coming. I uh, just wanted to ask about when you're training these networks uh, using very, very dense matrices and then afterwards trying to sparsify them, it makes me think that really what you're doing from the very beginning is trying to phrase this as some sort of lasso problem where you want to find a very sparse solution in the first place. And I was wondering if you know of anyone that has any success or if it would be, if there's any work that would be uh, good in doing in making a lasso problem of the neural network training. So um, I didn't quite, you said a something problem, but basically you're talking about the problem of finding the sparsity directly rather than sort of training, training it densely and then pruning it out. Yeah, almost more like as if you're trying to find, say, a, a sparse inverse covariance matrix mm -hmm. uh, and, and use some sort of iterative uh, shrinkage yeah. algorithm. Yeah, and no, I've, you know, I've surveyed the literature a little bit. I wouldn't say it's been exhaustive, but I've not found anybody who's done that. I wish, I wish they would because it would make it faster. Right now, probably the one weakness of the, um, of the prune networks is that it's a longer training process. You have to train the network to begin with and then prune it and then train it again, although that second training is much quicker. Um, again, thank you so much for the systematic approach to improve uh, DNN. This is great mind blowing. Um, uh, I'm gen generally from Huawei uh, Technologies. Um, we actually have been doing that uh, in this area, but I, I want to understand uh, you, your opinion, your guidance here. Let's say we start from uh, 128 GPUs. Um, 
So you, you talk about memory and network overhead. Uh, we all know you are the network experts here. So let's say we pick two ker uh, three kernels, uh, ILU, uh, uh, convolution, and uh, the weight updating. You mentioned the weight updating, you mentioned the convolution. Now between the three kernels, uh, which one, when we go beyond the current uh, shared memory or direct memory access clusters, which one could be more like network intensive? Yeah, nor normally, um Normally people will only employ model parallelism within a cluster just because you've got to move so much data around and, and you can um, do clusters of up to like 8 or 16 where you're sort of directly writing the memory of the remote GPU. Um, and then if you're going to go above that, people will normally use um, data parallelism. And with data parallelism, the only thing that you really need to exchange are the weights. You basically, after each mini batch, you, you have to basically transmit the delta weights around so that everybody sees every delta either by sending up to a parameter server and back or by just circulating them around all the workers. So it's, it's typically data parallelism that you use at the outside level. Yeah, but when we go beyond larger networks, right, uh, I, I'm just, uh, I guess I'm making it up now. If we have uh, a cluster over 128 GPUs, would LU be a problem there? Because LU can be very uh, network intensive. Um, when you say AOU, you mean by ba basically doing the matrix vector multiply. Right, right. Yeah, but you won't, you won't do that over the network, right? You'll do that entirely within one cluster of GPUs. Any, any model decomposition will be entirely local to the cluster, and, and the parallelism you'll get across clusters um, will be basically data parallelism, where you're running separate models on different subsets of your input set and exchanging parameters. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Hi. Thank you for the presentation. It was really interesting. Uh, I have uh, two questions. One is about this slide. Uh, I guess there is a typo. It should be n squared for, and logarithm n. Isn't it? Yeah, it should be n squared logarithm n squared. That's, uh, hold on a sec. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. sorry about that. And yeah. one more question. You had a plot where uh, with x uh, axis there was number of GPUs and uh, Y axis had a uh, number of seconds and there was a point that had uh, 10 to 18th power of seconds. Uh, how is that possible? How could one measure such oh, a so, so what, what was the chart? Was this the Baidu one? Uh, there was a linear curve and Y axis had uh, 10 to 18th power of seconds. Yeah, now, so, since 10 to the 18th power of seconds is probably something like 100 years, they clearly didn't run that long. I think they did an estimate running a small part of the computation and extrapolated how long it would have taken had they used just one. Actually, all the values in the Y axis second. were very large. Let me, let me find that. Um, this was the Baidu chart. We got some real fact-checking sort of people in here. Oh, it's 2 to the 18th. Is this the chart you're talking about? Uh, could you please show it? Oh, yes, it, it, it's it. Yeah. So you're just using a different radix. Sorry? Yeah, I believe they actually did those runs, too. So 2 to the 18th would be something like 10 to the uh, 15th seconds. So even, I don't understand, the smallest value is, uh, oh, it's 2 to 18. Yeah. I see. OK, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Uh, the stochastic rounding technique that you described earlier reminds me a lot of uh, simulated annealing in that uh, the limited precision computation has the effect of a sort of introducing artificial local optima that the addition yeah. of noise escapes. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if anybody has actually actually thought of the problem in this sense. I think some of the results, the classical results from simulated annealing about uh, temperature scheduling and convergence rates do apply. Yeah, that, that's an interesting observation. There is that probabilistic sense to it. I, would, I should probably go back and read um, the paper and see if they mention that. I can't recall. It's been a while since I've read that paper. OK, are we done? OK. So uh, thank you very much. Let's uh, thank Bill. Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available.